My name is Andy Knight. Uh, I'm the co-owner of the Forbes store. Your store is yeah. Swindon. Yeah. Big glass front, amazing mannequins in the window, all dressed up. With our business, it's all organic. You build brand in 2023 on social media. Nothing is landing on your lap. Like we are on socials hard. You know, we push it. It's a fucking advertiser space. People with the deepest pockets. I don't chill. I get up at 5.30 every day and I go to bed at 10.30, 11 o'clock and I don't fucking stop. I think someone said to me one, it's just make yourself indispensable. And what I've always used that for is like, be so fucking good that you command the chips. I was a RAF kid. My mum and dad actually got a post in when I was 18 years old. So they moved to Cyprus. So I was left there by myself and I just grafted. I've always had to work. It's never been an option for me. So I was just a young lad. 22, 21, running another another store in the town. He's just like, I fucking need that guy to come work for me. He's approached me, I'm like, I ain't coming to work for you. I want X and I want X. Which is a significant money hike and I wanted to be the buyer. He's just like, fucking let's go. That That's what I think is a cut above the rest. <sighs> look at this guy, look at his smile on him. There we go. I'm looking look forward to this shows because I'm looking forward to this one because I like doing it, these with people that I know and have known for a while. Yeah. Because you can ask them about various points and you well, saw bits along man. the journey. you got to remember, man, like we go back in pre... What, do you want to do this on camera if you want? Yeah. Do you do this? Let's, let's, just, let's oh, roll oh, with oh, it. Are we just talking anyway? Yep. Um, I remember you when you were a young lad and you were just, your, your dad's company was pumping and then you're just like, Andy, man, you fucking got some of mate. <laughs> like, you got some of <laughs> You'll come work for me. That is and what you got I this, like, you got this, like, young guy going, yeah, man, you can come work for me. I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> and nah, that, I love it, mate. I that was it. when I must have walked in the store at probably about a size 38 waist, if not bigger as well, back at that time, uh, looking like still, a tomato. Still, you're a confident lad, though, mate. You're still <sighs> a confident lad. A bit too confident, because that was actually, I've got a little list here of points, and... I was going to say, one of my first memories of both of us was walking into your store and trying to hire the owner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, and it I was. remember it. And, and, you, and that, that energy stayed with me. I remember it. And like I said to you with socials, like I'm all over socials. You know, love it, hate it. If you're in business, you've got to have it. You know what I mean? And if, you, if you're in business and you don't do it, then you're probably leaving something on the table. You know what I mean? So I think putting down putting down your journey. It just allows other people to, to feed off it and watch it. And I've watched it and I've watched your, your, your vibe for the last few years. Um, and and I mi I've missed you a couple of times in the shop. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then you came in there. I was like, fucking out. There like, he is. Fucking out. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing ever changes. And back on mine, I'm like, I wonder if you'd ever want to just tap me up for a chat. And then literally you were Bang. like, fancy getting in the van. I'm like, fuck yeah. I mean, I mean, I had to explain that it wasn't just getting in the getting van. In the we van. were doing a podcast. You didn't need to explain. But, do you know what I mean? To explain to everybody that will be listening, that's just heard us waffle on for a minute, please, can you just give us a little run over for anyone that doesn't know, who are you and what do you do? So my name is Andy Knight. Uh, I'm the co-owner of the Forum Store, which is a streetwear store in Swindon. Um, and I also have a art broker in business called nonart.com. Family man. I like to travel. I like to walk mountains. I just like to do stuff. You're always out and about getting always up to all sorts of different stuff. Yeah. And how do you find balancing all of that? Has it finally fallen into place in a way that you can manage everything? Because it's not always easy when you're doing multiple things. Yeah. I mean, that's a tough one, right? So like I'm in retail. So I think obviously in the pandemic, you know, travel, hospitality and retail got hit the hardest. You know, I mean, there's other kind of, there's other businesses that have, but like the majority, the landscape has changed massively for us. I like the balance. I like being under pressure. I work better under pressure. I don't, I'm not much of a planner. I like to like, Well, you didn't like, even do the questionnaire for this. Like, <laughs> you like spontaneous like and in the moment. I, mean. I, I yeah. like to just, I like things to flow, but I think we probably, you know, now I've got a family, uh, you know, life is a little bit more kind of mapped out a little bit. It just is, you know, you've got to think about schools and all this kind of stuff. So a little bit into more into the future, but I like to think of life in like two year cycles. So always kind of always, because it's way more manageable, right? You know, thinking about things way off into the future, I, I just find it a bit too daunting and a bit too planned out for me. Now, there's no doubt whatsoever that there'll be a lot of people listening to this that are definitely from Swindon. They've been in the forum. They know the brand. They know you. They follow you, probably a lot of your followers. And 
to a lot of onlookers, it's like, oh, brilliant, because they've all been in the forum. It's doing brilliant. It must be doing great. And he's off doing X, Y, and Z. But I guess when when you look at it from um, more of a business perspective and from the outside, I, I must think, Christ, these last few years must have been a real challenge with retail because we Absolutely. all know that retail is getting harder, yeah. especially on the high street. So what would you say, though, on the flip side of that has been the best points and where are we kind of now? Oh, good question. Um, so at the end of the day, no matter what line of work, obviously I've just coined retail hospitality and travel, but I think everybody's had to adapt into the new world. You know, all the pandemic has done is sped up the world, right? So, you know, whatever happened in two years was probably going to happen in 10, but it just condensed the way people shop, how people think, how people travel. Um, so for me, for, for, for us, for me and Dez and the team as a business, we've just adapted, man. You know, and if you said to me, you know, um, before the pandemic that I'd be jumping on and talking in front of a camera for an hour going live, I'd be like, you're fucking crazy. But we did. And through all the lockdowns, you know, we were the ones that were being super active. And for me, I think throughout that very, very weird time on this planet, the people with the businesses that were adapting, overcoming, a lot of people kind of recognize that, you know, and then obviously coming out the back, coming out the back side, the, the other side of the pandemic, I think people respected it. And I think we stayed at the front of people's minds. Um, and obviously after that, the business has completely changed. You know? Like we are on socials hard, you know, we push it. We do not leave any stone unturned. And did unturned. you find before that then, so pre-pandemic, all your business was walk-ins and people that were in town that knew what the brand was? Um, again, tough one because obviously Swindon, you know, people do throw Swindon under the bus, right? You know, that's, it's always been the same. Pre-pandemic, it was Brexit. It was fucking always something to blame. You know, the demise of the high street online. We weren't online. So we launched online between lockdown one and lockdown two. So that when I talk about adapting to the, to, to, to the timeline, we did, you know, we went online, you know, uh, probably a little bit late to the party. Of course, people you, know, you could have been online 10 years ago, but you can't think like that. You know, we reacted to that and it's probably been one of the biggest, biggest um, things that this business has gone through. You know, even the way people shop now, you know, like going into, sw doing anything is a mission. Going out for dinner, you've booked it. <laughs> going into a town centre, you know what you're going in for. No one's just really just floating about unless you're in a big key city. Because money's tight. Well, money's tight, but everybody just seems to be fucking busy. <laughs> and has their life planned out. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know what I mean? And I think we're not a small market town where you're just casually walking around having a scone or buying a book. Just, do you know what I mean? From a little independent. We're not a key city, so it's not, um, it's not got this huge, uh, what do you call it? Presence or uh, no, not footfall? No, uh, what do, do you call it when there's fucking millions of people around? Traffic. <laughs> Traffic. <laughs> Fucking hell, I can't even think of the right word. <laughs> Stadium? What no, do you want? No, 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 no. Um, oh, fucking hell, the word's gone. <laughs> but yeah, we're not a key city. So we're a small working class town. And I think small working class towns up and down the country have all been hit by, pan by the pandemic, or were hit by the pandemic. So I think, like I said, for socials, online, we did loads of things to overcome that. And it's, and it's been a massive benefit. And for people that haven't seen it, but your store is inside the Bruno Shopping Centre in yeah, Swindon. Yeah. Big glass front, amazing mannequins in the window, all dressed up, a lot of black and white theme to the brand. If you haven't seen it, I'm sure the website will reflect kind of what the store yeah. looks like. Yeah. But obviously one of the, I'd say the USPs of the store is going back to that point at the start that when I walked into the kiosk, I was like, this guy could come and work for Paystone. Like he'd, he'd just yeah. sell anything to oh, anybody. It's customer service. Yeah. yeah. So, so without a shadow of a doubt, like the, 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 the forum's USP is the customer service, the hands-on approach to retail. And, and, and I'm, if anything, I'm bad for it because, you know, if I go into a store, if I go and get a coffee, if I go into any shop, if I don't get customer service that I think I deserve, then it affects my day. It fucking winds me up. But you're never going to get that at the forum. Like we are, we are super hands-on, not too salesy, but really, really, really kind of friendly. And, you know, we're a safe space. You know, we've got people coming in that aren't even coming to spend money. You know, in a world where, you know, everybody's, there's, there's flags all over everything now, but everybody's kind of, even on the mental health kind of thing, we get people that like to come in and just have a chat. And I think that, that is the forum. You know, 
that that's what I think is a cut above the rest. I think as these young lads kind of grow up, and obviously our customer has grown up, we've been doing it. Our, you know, the shop's been going 21 years. So as these kind of guys grow up, when you go to different cities, when you go to different countries, and then you go to clothes shops like us, which there ain't that many left, and you don't get that service, I bet you, like, you know, people flagging their heads like, fuck, man, yeah, them boys, them boys are on it. So 21 years was just mentioned. Yes. Because I know we're going to get on to Known Art in a bit, and I'd definitely like to go all through that. Yeah. But 21 years is a long time. So how old are you now? I'm 43. 43. Yeah. So you set that business so up I, so, so with a partner? With a partner, yeah. So basically, so uh, just going back, back, I'll give you the quick, I'll give you the quick version. So there's my business partner. He had a company called The Forum, uh, called Sumos. Then he started a company called The Forum. So I was just a young lad, 22, 21, running another another store in the town. He's just like, I fucking need that guy to come work for me. He's approached me. I'm like, I ain't coming to work for you. I want X and I want X, which is a significant money hike. And I wanted to be the buyer. He's just like, fucking let's go. So within, <laughs> so within six months of the shop, the forum being opened, I started working for him. Six years later, I've turned the forum into a really successful brand. Sumo's wasn't doing as good. He's just like, right, I want to merge both and open up a big forum. I'm like, well, unless you make me partner, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm going to go do something else. So I took a bit, I borrowed a bit of a chunk of money, paid into the business and the rest is history. So from that day forth, so that's like what? And that's your partner, Des. That's my business partner, Des. So Des had been in retail. I think Des has been in, I don't know, he's probably been in the game like 35 years. So yeah, basically after making me partner and moving into the big store, the, sh- the, the business just went from, yeah, it just, just went crazy. But there'll be so many young lads listening to this, and especially ones that are into clothes. Yeah. And I mean, your day was way before the day of being able to sit here and go home and open a Shopify store and start selling clothes online. Yes, yes. So we know how you started and then how that partnership happened and then what become the form. But how did you become that person that was in the store that you wanted to hire? What was your journey up to that point? What did Charlie So, like? like, you know what? I think for me, I'm not going to lie. It, shit didn't really click for me till I was about 21, 22. So I was a RAF kid. My mum my dad, my and dad actually got a post in when I was 18 years old. So they moved to Cyprus. So I was left there by myself. I always throw them under the bus for that. But it's almost like it's made me who I am today, right? So I stayed here and I just grafted. So I kind of, as I've always had, I've always had to work. It's never been an option for me to float or yeah. other people to Have carry me. That, that's never, that's never been on my radar. Um, but I think, um, I think it kicked in for me about 21, 22. And then after I got poached and obviously I just found something that I was incredibly fucking good at. And I would say that I do like dressing up and I do fucking love clothes, but I love selling shit. And I think that is what I really, really enjoy doing. So I think I found a thing that I was good at. And then to, to be honest, I think someone said to me once, and I can't remember where I heard it, it's just make yourself indispensable. And what I've always used that for is like, be so fucking good that you command the chips. You know, so like if you're so good at what you do, the employer is scared to let you go and or flip to that. You put yourself in a position that if you want to get paid more money, you get paid more money. But I think I can, I still go to bed today knowing I worked the hardest I possibly could every day. Which explains why you had to graph so much and where to go. <laughs> what it doesn't do is I am absolutely useless at styling myself. Right. Horrendous. You, if you followed me for all those years, no doubt you'd have been sat there at night thinking, what the fuck is he wearing? But, and my mates most recently have been taking the mech out of some jean choices that I'm making that were turning my legs into sausages. So I don't believe you can just be good at <laughs> styling yourself. So where did that love come from? You know, what made you want to start in that path? Or was it just you just ended up in it? Oh, you know what? what I, think I, I think I just ended up in it. And at the end of the day, mate, don't, be, don't get me wrong. You fucking go back to some old photos at the forum, man. I probably wore some shock. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, I think, like, I'm, I'm a positive guy. I will always see the positive in everything. And I never think, don't ever think you're too cool. There's always a cooler version of whatever you're wearing out there. 
Do you know what I mean? So, but a little so bit like, like if you've got a richer you, guy. I, but there's not even, I wouldn't even class richer, but there's always like a cooler version of what you've got on. Do you know what I mean? I never okay. throw things under or, the bus. Or someone that wears it slightly better. Yeah, just, you know, like if you've got a pair of cargos you've just picked up, you're like, oh my God, these are fucking badass. Don't, don't put yourself too much on a pedestal. Do you know what I mean? Just be comfortable with what you, what you wear. Obviously, I'm kind of lucky, or I feel I'm lucky, and it was weird because if you're going through the 80s and the 90s, obviously you went through some serious styles. <laughs> yeah. Birth of hip-hop you know, skateboarding culture, being a little subculture. Now it's, you know, things are more normalized nowadays. So we went, I went through those decades and I skateboarded, you know, so I, I was, I'm kind of, I was wearing things back then that has all been kind of <laughs> brought back to light now. So do you know what I mean? I didn't, I don't know. I kind of classed myself quite lucky. I like, I, I'm very fond of where I was, and where I'm from. So I think from a clothing perspective, you know, I've never really followed trends too hard. And I don't think the forum has, you know, we're not, we're not a catwalk shop. We are very much a streetwear store, you know, where that consumer is incredibly real. His feet are on the street. He's, he's level headed, you know, it's tees, it's hoodies, it's nice pants, it's good kicks. Do you know what I mean? I think that some of these fashion fresh. houses, you know, great, you know, like fashion houses exist and it's, you know, they're, and they're good at what they do, but it's a specific kind of punter or customer. Do you know what I mean? hundred percent. But how is it that if you, you said you were just straight into work, straight into grafting, there's a difference between. I wouldn't say straight. Work. I wouldn't say straight into grafting. Okay. I think because when they, when, so between 18 and 22, 21, I worked at Motorola in a factory. Do you know what I mean? And I remember I worked loads of different factories with my mates. So I kind of jumped around. Which helps my point, which was, how did you learn how to run a business? Well, I'm not going to take full credit for that because I've got, I've got a business partner. So what me and Des are renowned in our industry for, we're definitely yin and yang. I'm the optimist optimistic. He's very pessimistic. You know, he's very kind of back of house admin. I'm very much vibe direction. So that combination has got us here today. You know, so if you start, you know, say, you know, show me the books, I ain't showing you the books. You know, that's what he's there for. Just like he's not going, oh, what, what can we create today to try and get a thousand people through the door? He ain't doing that. So that's very much where we are an incredibly solid team. And I would never take that away from him. And if he was sat here talking about a business, he's not telling you that. He's not saying that he's the part. You're the I blue run. sky thing. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And I think it's really good in business, you know, from what we've seen, you know, and it's funny because I, again, because I'm very much like, I just think everybody's sick, <laughs> you know, we are living in a weird world where it's very much, it can be very much smoke and mirrors. You know, people can pretend, you know, with online and social media, you can perceive yourself to be way bigger than you are. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Whereas if you look at our content, it is us <laughs> in the shop, fucking gassed. And you started <laughs> that in COVID properly well we no 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 no. we we've been you know obviously i could go way back i've had a brand you know we collaborated with loads of different celebrities back in the day so we've we've pretty much ticked all the boxes as the time's gone on obviously if i go back to the brand side to the brand side when known first started man i was doing i did this fucking party with plan b on top of soho shortage soho house got a t-shirt and he did a live gig to 50 people i'm like what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, just moment. fucking crazy, crazy stories. But I just think that I would probably say it was a bit of a turning point for the business because I would never say that the forum has ever got stagnant. I wouldn't, but I'd be lying if I said pre-COVID, I'm saying that there's, we need to fucking go online. He's just like, mate, it's just the fuck it. It could just be a headache. So we always kind of came to a little bit of loggerheads on that. Okay. But obviously, during COVID, uh, uh, the, the hand was forced. You, you, ha you had to. You had to. Now you, or never. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, it's different because it's, it's really hard with, you know, with our consumer. Obviously, we've got 
our online sales, which is great. And that's a growth pattern. But even the people that come into the shop now, like I kind of doubled down earlier, people are busy. People check a website, see what's there, and then decide to come into the shop. So, you know, that's another thing that you can't really monitor. Are you struggling with different elements of running an online store? Because they are different to in-store. For arguments sake, stuff like returns, right? Yeah. Well, we're, touch wood, we're all right. <laughs> so, you know, it's, we're not, you know, like our online store, go and have a look, man. It's super clean. There's loads of nice products. You know, it's super easy to navigate. The filtering system's great. You know, we know and we kind of, we, we analyze that, but we ain't fucking giving any away for free. We're not doing free returns. Do you know what I mean? So there's, if you were to look at like, what could we do here? What could we do there to improve sales? There's shit that we could do. But, it doesn't necessarily but again, mean you know, there's margin. again a bit, a bit, bit more kind of business sense. He's just like, well, if you do that and then that and then that, then we're not even fucking making any money. Yeah. So, you know, people can go off a cliff, you know, ASOS, are they in trouble? At the end of the day, I don't know, but they chase turnover I, as well. They, they exactly. Well, there's this, this line saying, um, turnover, vanity, profit, sanity, yeah, cash he, is king. He, he fucking loves that one. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, but at the end of the day, it, it, it's true. And, you know, with, with our business, it's all organic, you know, which fucking people just think is crazy because are we leaving money on the table there? Could we be doing shitloads of Insta adverts, Facebook adverts, all that kind of stuff? We could. You know, but then it then it puts a lot of onus on stuff, doesn't it? You're looking for that return, you're hunting for it. Whereas for organic, it kind of almost falls on me a little bit to go. It's a relationship. I wake up every day, business. exactly, and and I just like I said, I come to work and I'm right, right, fuck it. What are we gonna do? Let's. There's never there's never an, an empty five minutes for me in the shop ever. But with all stores, whether it be brick and mortar or an online store, there's always a plan if you're a business and you've got a duty when you start employing staff to think about the longevity of that brand and how it would carry on, even yes. if you weren't there. Yeah. Now, if you're that damn good at selling and you're that good at getting people in the door and know all their faces, how important <laughs> has it been to find the right staff? Do you currently have the right staff? Yeah. And what, what does that currently look like? For well, that our, store? our staff are fucking amazing. We're like family. You know, Kay has been our longest, longest standing member of staff. He's been there for like 10 years. Guy, new man on the scene. I think he's been there almost two years. So we've got a couple of weekend staff. One of them's been there fucking 15 years. He's like, he's on a 999 call. He's happy to just muck in, muck in, whatever. But we are an incredibly hands-on business. Incredibly hands-on. Um, so staff are 100% key. You know, without a shadow of a doubt. Um... Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah, we are salesmen. So, you know, I think there's an element there where, you know, don't go and approach that guy. If you haven't got it in the tank, just let one of the salespeople do it. Maybe like me. Okay. Obviously there's his, there's his time in the water has is proved that he's a good salesman as well. Um, but <laughs> if I'm honest, like we are obviously very crucial to the business, but I do think the consumer is becoming way more savvy. I think a lot more customers that walk through the door, like I said earlier, have seen the product that they like. They're not walking into some, they're not walking in blind. So they've kind of got a bit of a picture on what they like. But for me, in sales, if you come in for a t-shirt, you're buying a pair of jeans and a pair of shoes. It's that upsell. Added value. It's that upsell. It's like, it's like trim it back. It's a coffee shop. If you're a good coffee shop, you're upselling a pastry at the till. Think of that. That's going to double your day. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But if you get someone, think about it. Whoever's listening, next time you go into a coffee shop, if you go into a good coffee shop, they're like, anything here for you, mate? And, <laughs> and it's you, presented and, you, and, you and think, smells you think, good and looks good. And actually, you know what? Fuck right it, way. I'll take one of them. You've just doubled the spend. Yeah. <laughs> and then you've got other people that don't give a shit. A handover, wouldn't even give you eye contact. Think about it. You know, oh, it so, bothers me there, too. But, it there, does. but there's businesses that you that are just super simple, right? Obviously, there's loads more layers to set in. I'm not, you know, the coffee needs to be good and pastries and this kind of stuff. But if you've got seven products in front of you. I'm not being, I'm not throwing it under the bus, but it's an easier sell, isn't it? Instead of a customer coming in and you've just, you're surrounded by 500 products. So I don't know, man. Um, I, um, I don't want to gas us up too much, but we. <laughs> and what percentage of those customers are people that just keep coming back? Well, obviously our return, our return customers, you know, our loyalty and return customer is why the forum's the forum. You know, that's just doubles down on our customer service. But obviously we are also, 
seeing a lot more new traffic coming from social media. And that's a lot more people traveling from out of town. You know, we have Reading, Birmingham, Bristol all the time. People coming in, seeing us on TikTok, seeing us on Instagram, and they're, they're making a trip coming to Swindon. And that's how important socials have been for oh, the business. Oh, fucking so. like, so, so important. So important. And do you do that all organically? Do you, do you invest anything we into We don't them? invest any money. It's all organic. It's all organic. So you can still grow <laughs> all them people out there a social media following you and can. push in 2020. 100%. And what is the key? Oh, Benji, man. Being don't, different. Get me, don't get me started on this because I could talk of fucking forever. <laughs> <laughs> because I coach loads of people, man, from designers to people with brand, you know, to aspiring photographers. It's just like, look, you build brand in 2023 on social media. Nothing is landing on your lap. You know, it's not. The followers what, are way more savvy. What, what, what is it? TV? No. Magazines? No. You know, like you, you can, you build brand 2023 on social media. Full stop. I mean, if you then talked about what social media, at the end of the day, you know, my opinion on, on Instagram and Facebook now, you know, controversial it is, is it's a fucking advertiser space. It's people with the deepest pockets. You know, you got, you got, you got platforms like TikTok now, which is a completely new new landscape of social media. You know, you create good content, it gets views. You know, you could have 10 followers and you could have a video that hits 10,000 views. And then the next day you think, sweet, I'm in. The next one gets 60. You know, it's an, e what that does, it creates an even playing field. Do you think the algorithm's a lot more fair Oh my TikTok? fucking God, like 100%. 100%, but it, it is the TikTok, they, they call it the TikTokification of social media. So it's not about building, an, you know, obviously you do build an audience, but it's not about, it's not, it's not the deep pockets. You literally, if you get your head down and really think about it and really want it, like you've got to have the humility to do it, right? You know, if you get, if you're, if you do 10 videos and, 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 and it doesn't work and you give up, then you didn't want the fucking business. Yeah. You know, you've got to, you've got to go for it. You've got, but that, that's if you, know, you want it. That's it's if you so want it. similar to this podcast because when you put it down on paper, it sounds so easy to make a podcast work, yet so little people actually make it work. Do you know, if you manage to get to episode, I believe it is 21 of a podcast and you've done it every week on the dot each week, you are in the top 2% of all podcasters ever in history. Really? Just by doing like That's 21 mental. podcasts week in, week out. So if you do a year where you don't miss a week for 52 weeks over that course that year and you get it out, same time, same time you've already put yourself in the top 1%. Now of that top 1%, that your podcast crazy. needs to be good enough to be able to make it somewhere and get the views and get the right stuff. But just by being consistent and putting it out on the right time each week at that right spot, you put yourself... 99 spaces ahead of everybody else. So yes, that is the fact about the top podcast. 1%. That, that, fucking, that blows that is, my mind. If I'm honest, I'm a bit late to the party when it comes to podcasts. I've been listening to podcasts for the last two years and I fucking love them. I love them. The reason I did this van, to be fair, is because it's accountability, isn't it? It's, you've got to make stuff as easy as possible to be able to get into that, say, top 1%. If you look at a few figures, it's like, how do I make this as easy as it can possibly be me to stand a chance of actually delivering those every week. Well, I just looked at it and thought, well, how the hell am I going to phone up Andy at the forum and say, can you drive to my house after work tonight and sit in my shed in the garden or on my kitchen table and we'll film an episode? Mm -hmm. <sighs> I've had a long day, Ben. And it, it's what it would be with everybody. So it's like, how do I make it easy to get the guests? Yeah. But also make it easy for me to get to them. So the easiest way was to put it mobile in a van. van oh, and because the van cost me a few quid, it, it incentivizes me to want to do yeah, it and yeah, to yeah, get yeah, it right. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously the way I justified it to myself is I love talking to people. I love talking to guests. I think talking just opens up so many possibilities in life. No matter whatever it is, you just never know the next sentence that's going to come out of somebody's <laughs> mouth and where that can take you. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I think like just doubling down when we started the conversation on, I actually fucking, when I saw you, I'm like, shit, man, it's Ben. <laughs> and I genuinely wanted to catch up with you. And for me now, and again, it kind of, when people have that love affair of, of social media or not, ultimately for me, when I walk into the shop, I'm like, I'm just looking right. There's something in this room that's got a million views. I only want to get a million views today. That's how I look at the world now bit like fucking Terminator 2 where you're just looking around thinking 
the same thing for you. Like you want to talk, you're just like, well, this is good. Like we should get this down on camera. You know, if you see someone that you aspire to, you want to fucking get it down. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you could either, you get something from it. And I think that if that's where you're at and that's your mindset, the podcast is going to bang like hundred percent because you give a shit. You listen to Joe Rogan, man. Like I've listened to a few, well, I listen to Joe Rogan quite a lot. He just gives a shit. Yeah. And he can talk to fucking- When you like learning. Yeah. Yeah. And, but he's, he could talk to such a different variety of people and hold a conversation. It's three hours. He just fucking choose the fact. I think that ultimately is though, just because you either enjoy learning or you don't. And my old man used to say to me, Ben, you've got to learn stuff. you just got to learn stuff. I said, what stuff? He said, any stuff. <laughs> just try and learn stuff. That's and then cool. when you ultimately find conversations interesting, then you can have them. And on this one, we've spoke about all of those bits that have made, I've been part of that journey. I'm sure there's a lot more to do with the forum. But just like me, I can see it in you that you're 100% a blue sky thinker. Yeah. And love all those big positive ideas, which is likely why you've got other brands. Yeah. And you've touched on two of them so far, but one of them was known, which is a brand that sold in the forum and elsewhere. Yeah. So, Explain. so, so, so with known, it was a clothing brand we launched 2010, went on till about 2016. Um, went really well, got up to like 39 shops up and down the country. Um, sold in loads of cool streetwear stores, did loads of cool collabs. It's a really, really fond memory time of my life. I really enjoyed, but just, just one of them. It just didn't really stack up. Um, ultimately the profit. Ultimately profit. Then you kind of take a couple of wheels off. You chuck a bit of weight off the fucking balloon, expecting their hair to go up. And it was just, it was just, yeah, it just fizzled out. I still, you know, I'm still, this, the, 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 the online store still goes. I still got some t-shirts in the lockup, you know, That's still cool. there, but it's, I've got kids you know, it's like, and it's different priorities change, you know, and, and the business now takes a lot of my time. Like I'm working harder now than I ever have. In the forum. In the forum. Yeah. Because of the social media side of things, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, I think, I don't know, go and have a look at the forum store, but we are actually doing a, quite a good job and it's incredibly hands-on. So that takes a lot of my time and a lot of, to create content, and a lot of it on a daily basis takes takes a lot of thinking. And I guess you have to, because this was a point that I had written down, and you said that you perform well under pressure. Definitely. So then do you think it's a good idea for a competitor store to be opposite you? Because are they just fueling the fire? How has that relationship worked with having another clothing store directly opposite? Well, it's good. So like, you know, you could say, you know, would you want, do you want a clothes shop in a, yeah. Do you want to be the only clothes shop in a shit town or do you want to have loads of clothes shops in a good town? So the more retailers they are, the better the town is, the more people it brings. So if, if you're good and you know the people coming through the door, then you know that it is what it is. John and Annie been there forever. They're, in like, they're like an institution. Obviously, flannels opened up on their doorstep. You know, it's, it's not us. It's fashion houses a bit more higher end. So they kind of conflict between each other. And I think that's affected their trade, but we're a streetwear store, man. Like we've got a way more loyal customer, like I said. Um, so I think it's good. It's good that we've got another retailer off us. So us. You think that drives you? Yeah, definitely. I think the more the merrier. But in more recent years, one of your other brands has been art. Yes. You've been doing. Just explain. Waffle. Uh, so I, I'm a collector. I have been. I always have been. <laughs> I've always collected shit for as long as I can remember. I've got a pretty big Star Wars collection that I've had since a kid, and that's kind of gone on. Then I got into trainers, and I don't know, you probably remember. I obviously collected trainers for about 15 years, specifically a pair of it, like a silhouette called the Air Max One. Got to a stage where I had a fucking very, very recognized collection <laughs> in the UK. Went on loads of blogs, did whatever. Bought a house. And then, and then obviously just as, as alongside that, I've always collected art. Um, probably more so then, like just straight up street art. And then I bought a house probably around eight years ago, six years ago, um, which took everything. I had a couple of houses in Swindon, sold them, sold my trainers, and I chucked everything into this property. It was a dilapidated 
five-bed house from 1553 in the middle of Marlborough. It cost a lot of money. So we took everything at it, brought it back to speed. But obviously what that thing created, because I'd sold all my trainers, I'm like, it created, I need something. I created Craven. this void. And it's fucking weird because I'm like, okay, right. So the void. And I'd, and I'd picked throughout the years, I'd picked up a couple of Anxies and, you know, it's almost like, but nothing like big, big. But I had quite a nice little collection. And then I'm like, well, look, if I get one Banksy, then, you know, then, then my, my thirst will be quenched. Then I'll be good. So I got one. And anyway, kind of one thing led to another. So through all the times that I've moved and I've moved a lot, every time you move, you kind of fill a house full of art and then you're like, well, I don't really like that anymore. I'm going to flog it. So when you come to flog something, you always want to get your money back. Right? So if you then find yourself not getting your money back, you're like, well, should I have bought that in the first place? And I get that art should be in the, you know, the beauties in the eye of the holder and all that kind of stuff. But I kind of got thinking that some bits that I'd bought had just gone through the roof. So I'm like, you know what? I'm pretty good at spotting new art. Just some Banksy uh, bits? Some Banksy bits, yeah. I mean, Banks, I've Banks, been Banks, offered them. I can't actually wait to have this. So I'm Banks, saying, Banks, like, Banks, I can't Banks, be waiting. Banksy's to... just gone through the roof. Well, he's the highest investor of on the planet. Um, so basically, so through the years, I've bought and sold, right? So as the pandemic kicked in, well, I, so so ju- just before the pandemic, I was selling bits, bits here and there, bits here and there. Through the pandemic, obviously, you know, I don't know if you're into stocks and shares, but every, the world fucking stopped. No one wanted to get into anything. So what did people check their money into? Watches, classic cars, and art. So all of a sudden, I found myself sourcing and buying and moving some really big bits. Isn't that, is that because the forum freed up a little bit of your time because uh, of the scope not, of the not pandemic? Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. You know, that's just that's just DMs and conversations. And anytime anybody ever asks me about art, at that's, that point, I'm like, just give me a call. You know, just give me a call. We'll have a chat. You know, fuck this. Go in two and a front on a message. Give me a 10-minute chat, and then I'll be able to tell you what I think and whether or not that resulted in me sourcing someone something or whether or not they just wanted to go and get a download a print from the internet, whatever they wanted to do. But that's the kind of guy that I was. It wasn't like I had to sell something. But anyway, so in the pandemic, I was buying and sourcing and moving around a few bits, but there's a few clients that I'm just like, you would have bought something from me if I had a platform. Some people have to go to a platform and read about you and feel like that you are an actual legit business. You know what I mean? Hundred. I actually mm. feel like I could sell people websites without having a website about a website. <laughs> but <laughs> you need the website. About, you need the website for, when for they the check websites. Up on yeah, me. yeah, exactly. So just off the back of that, I then created the platform nonart.com. and that's it. That's the story, really. Um. So off the back of that, you know, let's not go too into it. But yeah, I do. I do good. Um. I. I can buy. I. I source. I more have. I'm more of a sourcer. So if you talk to me. And you were like, look, I want to, I've got X amount of money to invest, or I really like this piece. I can source it for you. So really in a nutshell, I would say you got, you're a bit too savvy to walk into a gallery because you're going to say pay pay a premium. You're not going to go into, you know, get down in the trenches, say, and get something because you might buy something fake. You don't know where you're navigating. I'm kind of pitched in between. So I've not bought um, a P I very recently bought my first piece of, a watch and I've always wanted to do it but I wanted to make it significant and things that I put into buying that watch I can now look at that watch and go ah oh, I know what went into that Yeah, and that's really cool and that's how I like almost emotionally connect with that object on the wrist rather yeah, yeah. than it just being metal Yeah, and um, I got I wasn't into our asshole ever growing up so uninterested it was beyond belief it's, a, it's amazing how one thing can just flick you and you suddenly are like wow this is just amazing and that thing for me I had a mate I've got a friend called um Zach, mega into his cars. And when he showed me around some art pieces that they've got and the knowledge that he has on those pieces and why they're important and why they're good and yeah. what went into them and how old they were and what kind of... It just blows your mind. It's like impossible if you like learning not to be in something. Yeah. Something like that. So you've got, you know, like I could I could gas up Banksy all night. I could talk about Banksy all day. For well, me, Zach's that's... got one on his wall. Well, good. Well, good. Painted on the wall of his drive. Has he? Yes. After that, I can show. <laughs> you can show me that after. It's a bit special. Really? Mm. Um, so, yeah, for me, you know, we're living in a time where 
you know, you've got, he's a humanitarian, you know, he, he does, he raises people's, uh, raises awareness about political issues right all across the, all across the world. Give me another artist that's ever done that in the world. You know, so I, th- I think we're living in it. We're living in basically, we're living in a genre of street art right now. And until there's another genre afterwards, street, you know, this one's like, this one isn't celebrated. So you've got pop art, you know, you've got all these other kind of like significant movements through art history. But at the moment we're in the fucking eye of the storm, mate. You know, so, you know, until Banksy's and invaders and shepherd fairies start hitting. So is now the time to invest? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, again, you could work with the market. Talk to me. I'll show you. I've got great, like, I could, I could show you, but what would be- We're on really, a podcast and he's but, selling me stuff here. No, 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 no. <laughs> But at the end of the day, it's all, like you said, I think what you're saying is like, you have a business brain, you know, don't, don't throw that under the bus. Don't think all of a sudden you're just going to fucking walk down the street and see a painting of some oranges and go, oh my God, I fucking love it. I need it. You'll still look at it, think about it. Find out about the art. You know that's how your that's how your brain works. I very recently did it with a classic car. Exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, fucking classic cars. Like, look, dude. Right. Um. My my philosophy on life, right, is don't buy don't buy something that depreciates. I can't do it. Right. Everything I everything I hence very, the collectability. Right. So I like I drive around a 1988 E30 and I fucking love it every day, and I've. You're not really spent money, man. You just moved it. I don't need a fancy car. Fair enough. You know, that's what, that's what floats your boat. You, you crack on. But, you know, I like, I like buying things that I know that appreciate in value. That's just, that's just who I'm. Which is and I I just not, and I'm not scared of spending money. You know what I mean? Oh, that 911 is fucking beautiful. Oh, you wait till you see it at the end of next week. But what baffles people say. So yeah, yeah, is, but you're going to, you're going to fucking mash it up, aren't you? Are you going to mash it up? Yeah, but it won't be to the point. And there's a reason for that, which is what I'm going on to. <laughs> people used to me, you can't stand appreciation. Well, with me, I'm similar, but I also need to, I need to have a justification to doing something. Now that car, to a lot of my friends and to a lot of people will be like, okay, he just spent 130 grand on a car. That, Is that how much that Porsche was? Yeah. Fuck because, me. Because he loved it. It's not just because I loved it. I fell in love with it and then thought, well, hang on a second. If I put this cash into the car, the way I try and look at things with that amount of money, what, how does it compare against a property? So that car, I looked at it, it's gone up 12% year on year in terms of value. Okay, it's an appreciating asset. It's actually slightly better than property at the minute. That's good. There's a few things going on in the world of cars that could kick it like a football and suddenly it goes from 130 to 250. Like those chunks are really gainable in terms of cars like that. I was like, okay, well, I don't, I don't think it's going to lose anything. But then I realised when I went to a car, I went to this car show in Belgium the other week and there was a, one of these 911s on these crazy wheels and air suspension. It was on this box pedestal with the guy's branding all the way around the outside for his business. And I just looked at it. I was like, that's mad. So I found the owner of the show so I could see how busy he was. I said, oh, I've interest. How many people come through this show? Is not between two, three hundred thousand. So I said, hang on. I said, that guy, oh, we had to pay to get the car here. Amazing. So they've spent money to get a collect car <laughs> yeah. at a show that is then on a box advertising his business. And that asset is sat just amongst people going up 12% Amazing. year on year yeah. and on top of that you can borrow against it at base rate plus to bit because they love classic cars so again going back to your point it, it's mad really because a lot of people will just say oh it's just a purchase it's a luxury item but you, there is ways of justifying things I mean you've I gone think. really in on the justification I'm just like I'm like I reckon that's going to go up in value and that's enough for me <laughs> <laughs> you're fucking looking at graphs and all that kind of stuff but brilliant but there you go then like you know I think it sounds like it's in the right hands but I remember when I bought mine so, so do you know how I bought mine? No, go for it right so I went so I what the fuck are we doing? having a second kid so this is probably about three years ago. I knew it was coming. I had a three-door Golf, just a piece of shit, because I drive around pieces of shit. And I'm like, I want a classic. I'm going to buy it. I want to buy a five-door. I went to fucking Auto Trader. I typed in four grand made before 1990. <laughs> and it was the third one down. I thought, fucking hell, that BMW looks sick. Not only does it look sick, I know someone in the town that has a really old B- Beamer. And I'm like, well, if I buy that, I could just take it to him. And it got, I bought it from Reading and I drove it straight to his garage. I went, there you go, mate. 
Fingers crossed he didn't buy a piece of shit. <laughs> and about a week later... Optimist. All right. And then right about a week later, he came out with a plastic bag full of bits. He goes, you owe me 250 quid. I'm like, mint. It was obviously Sweet. a good bite. And, um, it's, and it's never fucking coughed, mate. And I've been driving around for three years and I fucking love it. But if it had have coughed, you'd have needed some cash. And luckily, one of the bits that I wanted to get onto is the importance. You mentioned no night. You mentioned that you had your own brand. You mentioned the store. Now, there's lots of things that a lot of blue skies thinkers end up doing that we do sometimes chase every single rabbit in the field but sometimes need to grab one and realise which one is the one that's making cash but it clearly shows that having your art thing has helped over the years so what is the importance in your life of having multiple income streams and is it one of the things in a world of business that you would just say to people today um, I don't know man look at the end of the day the shop is my bread and butter that's my baby or well, our baby mine is his baby um Obviously, I've got my family. I kind of underestimated the second kid. The second kid does take up a lot of my time. You know, I started No Night a couple of years ago, and now we've got Coco, which is the second baby, and that does take up a lot. So with the, with the art business, it's as much as I put into it. So it's very, very, very manageable. Um, so the only thing I would say is I know myself, and if I'm chilling, I'm filling up that time. I will never chill. I don't chill. I get up at 5.30 every day. And I go to bed at 10, 30, 11 o'clock and I don't fucking stop. I sit, I sit down for dinner at 8.30. Go to the gym? Go to the gym. Every the gym day. at six o'clock every day for an hour. And I fucking love it. And do you think that's that routine from when you were younger? Or? No. So basically, I've, I've only just discovered fitness. So I've only started getting fit last, so about a year, uh, last February. It's the first time I ever walked into a gym. I've never even been on a treadmill. And the reason for that? <laughs> so it, I was supposed to start getting fit at 40. Then it was kind of the pandemic. And then I, because I don't go out and party as much as I used to, I kind of wanted to do something for myself. So now I do crazy challenges. So we did a 100K walk a couple of years ago with me and my mates. And then last year we did something called the Welsh 3000. And in January, we started training for it. And when I went up to the Brecon Beacons, I was, I'm like, I'm fucking way off here. <laughs> so I went, I basically got a PT. You have that moment, don't mate, you? I, I had off. it running up the well, stairs. Okay, all right. So, so it was, I think out of eight people, I'm two and I'm floating at the back on that walk in January. And I'm like, nah, nah, man, I'm not, I'm not this guy. So from January to July, when the task was, I had a PT and she got me through it. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done. The Welsh 3000 fucking brutal, mate. It's in Wales. And then from July up to the end of 2022, I'm like, give me some arms and make me upright. She kind of did that. And then it's like, right, it's time to part ways. And then I'm just going to do it by myself now. And I love it. I'm a bit more all round fitness. You know, I just want to be fit. I'm not too bothered about being huge. I just want to be in shape. So the next task is 18th of June doing something called the fan dance, which is a 26 kilometer walk with 35 pounds on your back in the Brecon Beacons. And then next year I'm doing Kilimanjaro. So it sounds like when you've got a challenge, you're up for doing it. Yes. So again, working under pressure, right? So that just reflects that mentality. So I want to be fit and I will be fit, but I need those constant incentives. So I'll go to the gym and I will work towards a challenge. You know what I mean? And what's the next challenge for the businesses? Well, so with the art thing, again, it's it's just fun. It, just is, it, it is fun for you. It's just, it's just a tick. With the shop, you know, there's always, I think for me at the moment, what, I've, what I'm holding in the palm of my hand is TikTok. That's the, that's the big challenge. You know, that's a constant, like, like you said, to grow this, to grow this podcast, you're not just going to talk to people. Put the cameras off and then it's done. You need to chop it up. You need to create the content. You need to put it out there. You need to feed off what people are talking about. Even all those little bits, all the little highlights from this conversation. Most you'll people pick up wouldn't know. And you'll be like, oh shit. And then that's going to open that door. And if someone sees a feeling, they contact you or you contact them. And it's always going to constantly open doors. So you can plan it. But you also don't quite know where it's going to go. And I think that's the beautiful thing about social I've, media. I've got a lad, um, Rowan, he's the assistant to this podcast, and you're on 28 hours a week. And all of that time is filled with doing things for this podcast. Just filled. Yeah. And it was time that I just couldn't 
invest into it away from my digital company and other bits and bobs like that. And it's been an absolute godsend because it is, the world is tough. Like the marketplace is tough running a podcast. You're up against, you're, you're competing for people's time. You know, in a, in a shot, you have to compete for a sale. You have to compete to get that person in the door and convert into a lead. Yeah. I'm competing for someone to give them an hour every single week of their time against Joe Rogan, against, against whatever. So you've got to have that person chopping it up to be able to put it out there to make it visible to, to show what moments are good that come across on I've it. Got a, I had a really fucking, I read a really good fact the other day on Joe Rogan podcast talking to Brian Cox. Oh, I love Brian, yeah. Right, and chatting away and he was like, obviously, there's huge things about AI, right? About AI taking slightly lower jobs and replacing human jobs with X, Y, and Z, right? You, heard, you obviously yeah. know this coin. So but he's like, so what? So, so Joe Rogan's like, so talk to me, what do you think? Are you scared? He goes, well, okay, look, why don't we look at it like this? Yeah, AI is going to replace jobs. But what are we doing right now? AI is not going to replace this. It's human interaction. This is humans interacting. This wasn't a job 10 years ago. So think about it. In a world where, yeah, it's changing, but I'm in this social media bubble. I don't look at it like that, man. Like, there's fucking kids. My kid's seven. He could become a Pokemon card seller by the age of eight. He could. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's fucking watching YouTube and there's just kids playing with toys. Do you know what I mean? And they got merch in the toy shop on the high street. We're in this world where you could do anything, man. You could do anything. And I just think, um, I just think it's exciting. I definitely think your story has been exciting. And I think to be fair though, I want to get you on and again in the future to talk about all sorts of more bits, but I love wrapping these episodes up so that people have the time to watch them in around about 40 minutes. We've done just that. So I cannot thank you enough for coming on. You're an absolute legend. Legend. I really enjoyed I wish that, you the mate. Best success. Cheers. All right, brother.